recording. So welcome everyone to our first meeting of our NCC. I'm calling this the NCCS CyRops Associate, although it's just because that's basically the training session it came from. Um, glad to have everyone here. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I want to go over again just very quickly uh, what the class sites are and how you are to use them. Um, very first one we have is canvas.stanley.edu, which you are pretty much finished with, okay, because I have already, you've done the initial assignment in here, which was just that um, introductory forum assignment, so you really don't have to worry about this site much at all. If you want to log in here and use that to jump to Netacad or NetLabs, you are welcome to do that, but honestly, we are pretty much finished with that site. Um, for what we need to do for class. Our second site is netacad.com, which is our primary class site. Now, folks, this is where you should be logged in. You should see your um, CyberOps NCCS SP22 class um, under you. By the way, if you do have the instructor role, don't get confused because a lot of people, uh, when you're in an instructor role, you go in first to your I'm teaching tab you won't see your class, make sure you're under uh, your I'm learning tab. Otherwise you may not see the class, our class. I see it under I'm teaching obviously because I'm the instructor. Um, but inside the class itself, once again, just a quick reminder, you gotta log in. Okay, I've not already done so. Um, but once logged in inside of the class, the Course materials are all pretty much inside of this netacad.com site. So this is where the um, content is. So the reading content for this particular class, um, you just click on the modules, some modules one through two, three through four, so on and so forth. So again, it's been very, very slow on my internet today. Um, but this is the primary site where you do your reading by clicking on the modules. You take your module exams by clicking on the group exams. Who can tell me how many times you're allowed to take the module exams? Uh, do I need to ask somebody? I think Wait. you said 10. 10, 10 times, okay? And you do not have to ask me to re-enable them for you. So you're able to take the exams up to 10 times, all right? Um, the module exams. Here's the reading materials, just like we said before. We didn't do much reading in class during our meeting together on Thursday and Friday of, of our two days together, but hopefully you've been doing the reading in this class. Um, I strongly recommend that, especially if you're not very familiar with networking, that you read everything in here. I don't feel like there's anything in this class that is super complicated to the point to where reading it, you can't understand it. Um, but just be aware that the, all the reading exists in here and you can jump anywhere you want within the reading by simply using um, the left-hand side navigation. The other thing I do wanna teach you, a lot of people don't know this, but even in a lot of people have been teaching for years and years in Netacad, but up here on the right is a course index. So if for some reason you ever want to just find the videos that are in the class, you can click on that. Or let's say you just wanna find packet tracers, or you wanna find animations, there, there is a way through this course index to do that. So just be aware that that is there. Or if you wanna look for a particular section, something, a uh, concept that you wanna look for, you could always just do a control F. Oops, control F didn't work here. Control F and I must have had a different context, but a control F and put in here um, sock. And you see how it will go down and do look for sock. In this case, it was picking up social engineering too. But you could go to this main course index and look for certain items. So again, important for you to know if you don't know about that. Other items where you're going to do inside of netacad.com is upload your completed lab assignments. So um, Paul, how many labs am I requiring you to complete in order to pass this class successfully? How many labs? How many labs? Um, mm, I forgot. I'm sorry. That's okay. Anybody else? No? I thought it was 10. No, nope, little 25. 25. 25. 25. 
Yep, 25 well, I'm glad labs. we went over that today. Yep, 25 labs that you pick out of the labs that are here. Now, again, I strongly suggest you do the labs that are towards the end because these labs are probably more important for you. Uh, in fact, if you're following along with the items that I sent out to my other, I'm teaching two CyberOps classes right now, by the way. One class started back in February. One class is started obviously with yours. Your class is much more condensed because your end date is officially May 14th um, for this class. But I just did uh, two labs this week for my other class. And in one of those labs, I showed how to extract a PCAP file from a, or excuse me, extract an executable from a PCAP file, which is one of the, the main uh, exam objectives. And then I also showed how to use Squeal, which is a um, security information and event management system to pull and look at an attack that had taken place and find information about that intrusion. Those two that I just put on my YouTube channel are very important for you if you have not looked at them to watch because they're, they're, they're going to really help you when you do the final skills exam. But again, you do your reading here, you do your module exams here, you're going to do your written final exam, which is right here, okay? What is the minimum score you need to make on your final exam? Richard, what, what is that minimum minimum score for the final exam that you need to make on the first try so that you get your certification voucher, your discount voucher? Is it over 75? 70, 70, 70 or higher will be fine. Um, let's, let's shoot for 75, but 70 or higher is fine. Um, that will get you your, your exam, your voucher. Um, so, Big thing there is when you take it, it's on your first attempt. If you don't make it on that first attempt, you will not get the discount voucher of 70%. Okay, questions about that? And I'll check and make sure it's 75, 70, but I think it's 70 instead of 75. It used to be 75, but I think they backed it down to 70. Okay. Finally, the last item that you will do here, you do have to do the course feedback folks before you can do the final exam. And I know you see that there are dates of 30th June here, even though our class technically ends on May 14th. I don't ever have my classes end on the actual end date um, simply because I always have people who work past the end date. I also know that uh, many of you will not be done by the 14th of May. And for that reason, just realize on the 14th of May, you will lose access to Canvas, but you're not gonna lose access to Netacad. Okay. Let's go check that just to make sure I'm not telling y'all wrong. I don't wanna, I get even get confused myself. Michael, do you remember it is 70, isn't it? Pretty sure that is correct. Uh, for some reason, I want to say 75. Um, right, let's check. Let's check. I could be wrong. Oh, I, I could very well be wrong, too, because I may. it's a 70% discount. Maybe it's 75 is the minimum. So let's go right here. Let's go to the discount process. Should be. Yep, it is 75. Nope, 70. That's what I thought. I thought they had changed it. Um, okay, 70. Okay. 70 or higher. It used to be 75 in the old CCNA version six, but they dropped it to you must make a 70 or higher on your first attempt of the final on this CyberOps Associate. Yeah, I think that's why I remember the, um, when I first started teaching, was the, I was on version six before it went to seven. So that is, that is what correct. I was thinking about. Yeah. Yep. So it is now seven. Okay. Um, another thing do any of you currently have your CCNA and need to renew it? sometime in the next, say, six months or so. Anyone on this call have their CCNA and looking to need to renew it sometime soon? Well, I'll, I'll be renewing mine. Okay, Michael, you know that when, if you complete this course successfully, you can turn in your CEU credits and you won't have to retake your CCNA. You'll get uh, credit for um, another three years for your CCNA by completing this course. Okay, yeah, that's what I was banking on. <laughs> yep, yep. So um, you just got to get this one finished for me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Kelly, 
I have yes. a quick question sure. on that. The written final exam, that's yep. the one you're talking about for the one that you have to make a 70 or higher. That is on correct. your first attempt. That is, is there correct. a time? Is there a time limit on that? Uh, there is, but I set the time limit at like four hours. Four hours. I either and did three do you or know four. Off hours. The, do you? If I click on it, will it tell me how many questions are? No, on it a, does not. It does not tell you. Um, okay. So it won't tell you anything about, and you don't want to do not start the exam and then leave it because that counts as an attempt. Um, so when you start that exam, you've got to complete it. And on that first you, exam attempt, you know, so basically if you go in here and you click take assessment, which I can't really do it because, um, let me do this. Let me see if I can, let me go back to this. I'll go into view as student. Uh, I always forget how to do this. Oh, here it is, Doofus, view as student. Okay, so, and I don't even think it will actually show me this because the student view is not really a student view. Yeah, you can't really do it because the students, it won't allow me to see it because even though you're in student view, you're not really in a student account. So it won't show you the, won't show you the full thing. But yeah, you will click, you will finish your course feedback. And then once that is finished, you will open up the final exam and you can take it. So it's roughly four hours. I think it's around 60 questions. I think it's what it is. Somewhere in that ballpark. Here's another good exam that I've got turned on for you. This is the actual certification practice exam. You can take this as many times as you want uh, before you take the uh, final exam. But this is to help you when you get ready to actually go take the certification exam. The final place that we have is netlabs.stanley.edu. That is, what do we do there, folks? By the way, Clay's doing some BGP stuff right now. This is where, if you will remember, you go to new lab reservation, schedule labs, you'll find your course, which for you is the CyberOps Associate class. And this right at the very top is your list of all of the different labs that you can do. Um, the two labs I did this week for my class and recorded um, going through them was 27.210 and 27.214 uh, are the two that I did today. But if you click on one of these, I say, um, tack into MySQL database. Remember, it looks like there's only four pods, but there's actually 20 pods. So don't be afraid to go out here. The red line is right now. You could schedule into the future. So don't think that you can only schedule right now. You can schedule into the weekend if you want to. But that red line is our current time. And you can do up to four hours on any lab reservation. Most of these labs you can complete in two hours. Okay. And then once you do your reservation, you will see that the lab is available for you. And it is now booting up inside of our data center. One of the very important things for you to note is that when you do the labs, okay, the content tab, you must use the document here again to do the lab. Don't use the one from inside the curriculum or it will not work, all right? So in this one, it tells you how to attack into MySQL database. It's gonna tell you what to do. And this one actually has you looking at a Wireshark PCAP file and watching the injection attack and looking at the HTTP, HTTP stream and going all the way through and seeing what happens. And there's actually, you can see it doing the, the injection attack. Enter the query 101 database and the database name is DBWA and database user root. So it walks you through how this attack took place. Questions about NetLabs. How do you answer these questions? You remember how you, I told you to do this? Anybody? Remember you just download the document. Okay. Download the document locally, and then you're gonna open it with Word. 
do I actually have to open Word up and then go get it? Word. Go to open. And where's that? Documents. Documents. Let's go down there and find the lab right here. So it's 1762. All right. So now it's going to convert it to a Word document. Once it's converted to a Word document, I can edit it. And so as I'm doing my lab in here and it asks me a question, let's find the first question. What are the two IP addresses? Um, I'm gonna make it, I see 10.0.2.15. You'll notice it's in white. So you had to change your text to be automatic. So the answer's here, so you can do 10.0.2.15 2.15 and 10.0.2.4. And then remember, you just say file save as, put your name on it on the front, and then you upload it into our course. So if I was doing this lab 15, um, I would upload it into the, the lab documents. Okay. Or what lab is this? 17.26, sorry. 17.26, I'd upload it right here. So that's a quick overview again of how you download it, convert it to a Word document, and then upload it. Unless, of course, you have a PDF reader. If you have a PDF reader, just, or PDF writer, just up, use it, put in your answers, and upload it as a PDF. That's fine too, um, if you happen to have that. All right. And then here's our workstation that's booted up. Almost every password, folks, if you run into a uh, particular um, login and you don't remember what the password is or for some reason you're confused about what the password is, nearly every password in this uh, entire class is CyberOps. Um, the username will be Analyst. The um, password will be CyberOps. Okay. Now, that's the three primary sites that we have and the two that you need to most worry about. I want to go back over this third one just because I want to make sure you're making use of this database. It's extremely easy to use. So if I go into here and I go to stanley.edu, okay, I go to future or current students, either one, just go to current students and go to library. I go to resources, A to Z database list and go to O for O'Reilly. Click there. And it's probably gonna go ahead and log me in because I was already logged in. So let me log out or let me actually, let me do a incognito. Stanley.eu. I had me already, <clears throat> already logged in. So that's why I was doing that. We'll go to library. Now, where do I go? I go library and then I go to well, resources, A to Z database list, O for O'Reilly. And then once it gets to the main O'Reilly page, I'm going to say that my school is not listed in the drop down because we are not listed in the drop down. So, institution not listed, put in your Stanley email which is the same thing used to log in to Canvas. So yours is probably um, some username at scc.stanley.edu. Click let's go. And then voila, you have access to literally just enormous amounts of information on any subject you want to get into. For our class for CyberOps Associate, you have a shared playlist and in that playlist, if you'll look at it, so you go under Explore, Shared Playlist, look for the um, CyberOps Associate Playlist, and you will see there's a full video course and the full CERT guide available inside this playlist. All right. So you really don't have to buy the um, a backup book if you don't want to, and if you don't want to listen to me, you can go listen to Omar Santos and Ron Taylor. And you can go through the literally an entire nine hour and 38 minute video course for you on this. Okay. 
questions about O'Reilly. Make use of that. I mean, that's to me a crazy resource for you to make use of. Okay. Now, hey, Kelly, quick question. Shoot, Michael. Um, how long does that uh, last for the, um, is it until IT yep. uh, does uh, away with the email? Okay. Yep, it's until yeah, IT does away with the email, which is typically two semesters after the end of your class. So for this class, because it's technically a spring class, you should, everyone in this class should have access through December 31st of 2022. So it's usually two semesters past the end. Okay. So it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty long while. Um, we are looking at extending our, our, um, our um, O'Reilly database subscription for the next two years. And so if we do that, then um, you know, we'll continue to have it. And, and I don't see any time soon. It went from being a brand new database to being the most used database on our campus in a single semester. So it was, um, it's pretty, pretty widely used on our campus by our, by our um, technology students, definitely. Okay. Um, any questions about those sites? Any questions at all? Okay. Any, now I want to open it up. Questions about the course? Questions about anything you've read so far and the modules you've been through? Um, I do have, and you all know this, in the syllabus, I do have in the syllabus due dates for everything. In fact, you can see that right now you should be working on, um, basically on the 13th of April, you would have labs for due. Um, so I have due dates for everything. And you'll see here 331 and 47. So this week we're looking at our network protocols and, and those items there. Um, and we'll go do a quick look at um, Ethernet and the Internet Protocol. We'll go look at Module 6 here in just a minute. But you'll notice that these dates are, you know, there's a lot I'm asking you to do in a very quick quick fashion. Um, just be aware of that. Um, be aware, too, that, you know, technically the end of the class is 514, maybe 512, 514, either one. But it's, you know, I understand if you don't get that, get done by that date, I just ask that you don't asked me to still be trying to run this class in July. Um, so I can give you some wiggle room, but I can't give you unlimited wiggle room. How's that sound? Any questions so far about any content or anything we've gone over or any of the, any of the, what I call class navigation, class expectations? None. So everybody's good. Everybody knows everything, sees everything. Everybody's like, it's finally clouds have gone away. Please shut up. And let me go outside. Okay. How about this? Now, questions about content. Questions about anything you've read up to looking at Ethernet and the IP protocol or any of these items. We've actually talked, I actually did some lecturing on this up through here. So I don't know how much more you want me to go through on this. The only thing I do wanna talk a little bit about is I do wanna make sure that you're comfortable with um, IP, what IP is, what uh, internet protocol is, version four and version six, and the concept of how it sits on top of the data link layer. So we've talked about this seven layer model. Uh, the, what kind of model is this? Janet, what is the name of this model right here? The seven layer model we're looking at. Janet, do you remember? Okay, maybe Janet stepped away. Um, uh, uh, all, all same model. OSI, yep, that is correct. The Open Systems Interconnect Model. This is the interconnection. 
This is the OSI model. So it is a theoretical model or of how two devices can package information to talk to one another. Okay. Chris, what was the other model we talked about? We had the OSI model and the other one was the Chris, what was our other model? You remember? No, it's evading me right now. I apologize. That's okay. It's TCPIP model. So remember, we discussed the OSI model and the TCPIP model, and how here's the OSI reference model. So we got all people seem to need data processing, layer seven to layer one or please do not throw sausage pizza away. And then we have our TCP IP model, which by the way, OSI is a theoretical model, even though, how many of you know that there was actually an OSI um, protocol suite that was created and was expected to be used, but nobody ever used it? Yep, Richard knows that. Yeah, there was actually an OSI model protocol suite with all the protocols with it and nobody used it. TCP, TCPIP model is an actual model. It's not a reference model. Now they cut, they they say it could be used as one, but it's really the TCPIP model is a real world model. And that's important because in when we look at these two together, they map in certain ways. So I don't have my I don't have my little tablet doohickey. Um, I usually have, I got a tablet in my in my uh, office but I'll try to do it with my, try to do it with just my mouse, which is gonna be difficult for me, but we'll, we'll try anyway. Uh oh, I'm okay. So I have a little uh, cheap um, Wacom tablet at home at work that I bought. Um, so looking here, we have, yep, we got it. You know, we got the application, we got the app, oops, yeah, that's hard for me. App, presentation, session, transport, um, network, data link, and physical. So all people seem to need data processing. This is the OSI model. Ooh, well, this is about as bad as it gets, y'all. I am left-handed, so trying to write right-handed is a little rough. Okay. Then over here is our TCP model, TCP IP model. And if you'll remember, it only has four layers. It's got the app layer. It's got the transport layer. It's got the internet layer. And it's got the network access layer. It's important I call this network access because it keeps people from getting confused about network and network. Do you remember how the OSI model maps to the TCP IP model? Anybody? Sure. Uh, what you got? Okay. Uh... <clears throat> TCP IP application layer maps to the application presentation session layers. Correct. So these layers here map to the app layer. All right. What's next, Richard? One to one to transport layer to transport layer. Correct. One to one. One to one to network layer in the internet layer or the network layer. Yeah. That is correct. And, and then, then this the uh, network access uh, maps to data link and the physical layers. Very good. Very good. Does anybody remember the two sub layers of the data link layer? Faith, do you remember the those? Go ahead, Mac dude. layer and the logical link control. Yep. Mac layer, which is closer to the physical layer. And then the LLC, which is closer to the network layer. Okay. And remember, this is where it kind of basically goes from hardware to software, okay? From a physical to more logical components. Very good, excellent. So these are our two main reference models. Now, as we go up, you know, we've got um, right here, we talked about a thing called ethernet, 
when uh, again I apologize for this horrific writing but Ethernet all right so we talked about Ethernet at the day link layer now we're going to go up and look at the IP layer the networking layer and look at what's going on at that particular layer and we talked about um, the fact that we have um, it's a connectionless protocol best effort um, it is a 30 IPv4 is 32 bits. We showed all types of things about default gateways and how it works. So here's our different types of addresses. And this does not go over all of IPv6 or IPv4, IPv6, but it just gives you a good overview of the different ones. If you really want to learn how to do subnetting and those types of things, you need to take Cisco 1, CSNA 1. Which, by the way, reminds me, there are six slots left in the summer um, CCNA one class um, that's free. So if anybody wants it, there are six slots left um, and it is open to adjuncts at your school if they are interested. So um, questions about IPv4, how about IPv6? Why do we even have it? Anybody know? I'm sure. asking this. How long has it been around, Richard? IPv6? Yeah. How long has it actually been around? I'm not sure exactly when it started, but it's been around uh, a good while. Since 1999 is when it was right. actually brought around. So it's been around forever and a day. Um, we haven't gone to it only because of NAT, Network Address Translation. But the reason for it, what was the reason, Richard? Because we're running out of IPv4 public IP addresses. Let's back up and say we have run out of IPv4 public addresses. So there are like no more. Two years IP ago? Oh, yeah. Well, it's more than that. I think it was almost four or five years ago we actually officially ran out. Um, now, they've done some things to kind of bring some addresses back and do some things to make it to where. Um, but we're out. There are no more IPv4 addresses. So what they had to do is develop a new 128-bit IPv6 address that is in what we call, and this was the official name for a long time, but they finally made it the official name. It's called a Hextet. So these are Hextets. You got eight Hextets. And um, each one of these is, you know, zero to FFFF, and it's in hexadecimal. So there's all different ways as far as how you can look and see IPv6 addresses. There's the long format, which is, I mean, honestly, that is a valid IPv6 address, 2001, 0 db8, quad 0, quad 1, quad 0, quad 0, quad 0, 0, 200. But we have some rules that we can do to shorten these things. First, we can always omit leading zeros. So this 2001, 0 db8, quad 0, et cetera, could become 2001, db8. We also can take and if it's quad zeros, since we're alleviating the leading zeros, we can get rid of all three of those leading zeros. So instead of having to write this super long thing out, it becomes 2001 DB80 quad ones, 000, 000 200. And that is because we know this is an assumed or inferred zero uh, in front of that 200. So you can take away all leading zeros. You also have the ability to replace one set of quad, multiple quad zeros with a double colon. Now you can only ever have one double colon. So for instance, in this address right here, we've got quad zero, quad zero, quad zero, quad zero. So instead of typing out all these zeros, we can actually shorten that to 2001 DB8 zero colon quad ones colon colon 200 and that's because we got one two three four five six seven eight hex stats here but when we shorten it to this we know we have one two three four five so we know there has to be three quad zeros in the middle here and that is why you can only ever have one set of of um, double colons you cannot do two double colons here because if you did if it was 2001 colon DB8 colon colon AB00 colon colon, you wouldn't know if there was three at the end and two in here or three here and two here. So you can only ever replace a set of contiguous 
quad zeros with one double colon in an address. But the neat thing is, take this one, look down here. This, which would be a pain to write out, becomes colon, colon, one. And this, if it's all zeros, is just colon, colon. Now, the important thing is this. IPv6's addresses are just like IPv4. You learned uh, when I was there last time that IPv4 addresses had a, a host, a network portion, and a host portion. IPv6 is exactly the same. It has a network portion, which is called the prefix, and then it has a host portion, which is called the interface ID. And 64 bits are for the prefix, 64 bits are for the interface. Now, the interface ID can be created in a couple ways. The most common way is an interface ID that is randomly generated. There was an old method which you could use, which allowed you to use um, an EUI 64, which actually used the MAC address to generate the interface ID. They went away from that because it was being used to track people on the internet. So they said, that's not a good idea. So let's not, let's not do that. Um, especially if you live in a country and they're trying to track you to get you and put you in jail. So that's why um, EUI 64 is not used. And they don't even really go into that in this course because that's a little bit more um, in detail than, than what this course really depends upon. Okay. Um, any questions on that? Any questions on ARP? Do y'all know what ARP is? The address resolution protocol, when you take a known um, IP address and you're trying to find a MAC address, we need those in a, an Ethernet network because that we've got to know the physical address in order to build our frame at layer two. Without that frame, we cannot package the information into a, a frame that gets sent to the destination, the final destination. And one of the things that's important to realize is with Ethernet, ARP requests are broadcast. So if A sends out an ARP request and says, who has this IP address and what's your MAC address? If it's a local device, that destination, 192.168.150, We'll send back an ARP reply and tell A, my MAC address is 000B, which is, by the way, in our examples, they shorten the MAC address. How many bits are normally in a MAC address, Faith? I think 32. No, 48. No, 48, I'm sorry. 48. Yep, MAC addresses are normally 48 bits. So MAC address is 48 bits. Remember the first 24 bits are the we, we, and then 24 bits are the serial number. And by the way, I make a joke of saying we, but that's really the organizational, organi organizational unique, unique, and I cannot type. Identifier. There's two English degrees are useless. Okay. Um, so organizational unique identifier is the first 24 bits, and then the last 24 bits are the serial number. So you've got to have that in order to build a frame in Ethernet because that is a primary portion of the Ethernet header, which, by the way, we discussed way back here in our Ethernet discussion. Okay. I discussed this with you, but don't forget proxy ARP. If a destination IP address is on a remote network, the local default gateway will respond with its MAC address as the MAC address for that remote destination. And that's called proxy ARP. Some of the issues with ARP is that it's very easy to spoof MAC addresses. And so a nefarious hacker can put themselves in the place of another device or make themselves appear to be the local gateway. And they then can have a man in the middle attack versus your network, which is hugely, hugely dangerous. Okay. And I have a video on it. I'm not going to sit here and watch a video with y'all. Y'all can watch videos. All right. Any questions? I am going to actually 
Let's see here. I'm gonna stop there, okay? Because I'm actually way ahead of where we are in the class itself, where we're supposed to be. Um, I want to stop here and ask. Oh, we got a chat. Okay. Um, stop here and ask if there are any questions about content, the class, anything. Folks, I really want everybody in this class to get accredited to teach it. All right, Richard, you got your hands up. That a question? You just forgot to put it down from a while ago. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I really want everyone to get accredited to teach. So please keep working. Let's get everyone accredited. Get you all where you can use this on your campus um, for your um, Sec 160 class or maybe some other class you want to use it on on campus. What other exam? certification exam that I mentioned to you, you can pass with just a little bit of study after you complete this class and get this class under your belt with its certification. Does anybody remember? The CYSA? Yep, the CYSA plus, sure enough. Very good, very good, Paul. Yes, yeah, so you can. So um, literally once we get done with this class and you study and go take your CCN, uh, CC, excuse me, Cyber Ops Associate, if you'll buy you a CYSA plus book study for about a week, you can pass the CYSA plus. So it's really kind of a twofer for you and for your students. Um, so I don't want you to forget that because it's a, a good way to kind of double dip one course to help you get two certification exams. All right, are there any questions? Uh, I believe I have set this up to be every Thursday from here on out uh, until May 14th. So um, I'll see y'all next week. If you have any questions in the meantime, any problems, please let me know. And we will uh, we'll go from there. Everybody? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank y'all for being here. And uh, bring your questions next week after you've done your reading. Bring them and we'll uh, we'll go over them. Thanks, everybody. Have a good, good day. Goodbye.